Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Killian O'Donoghue. I'm Director of Policy at Euroelectric. And I'm here today with Secretary General of Euroelectric, uh, Mr. Christian Ruby, to discuss this year's power barometer. For those who don't know the power barometer, it's basically a key set of indicators which look at how the sector has done over the last 12 months. So decarbonisation, prices, all these things, we look at that. But it also has a forward projection of how things will be looking forward to 2040, 2050. So we're going to discuss that today, but I think it's fair to say, Christian, it's, it's been quite a, quite a crazy year that we're going to deviate a bit from the prior barometer and just discuss kind of broader trends in the sector. So I think to kick off, if I may, um, one thing that's been somewhat surprising or shocking this year has been the price level. If you look at the, if we look at the prior barometer, we've seen very dramatic increases of prices. We've had the Russian invasion and kind of potential cutoffs in gas. But from reading the document, it seems to be, it's not just that which is driving the high prices. We've kind of had the, a perfect storm, per se. We've had the some extremely hot summer, which means we've had less hydro reserves, we've had droughts, and also we've had situations with lots of nuclear capacity being out. So can you maybe just summarize, why are prices so, so high at the moment? You mentioned a few of, of the uh, key elements that play in here. Uh, we have uh, uh, very little hydro compared to previous years. We actually have quite uh, uh, little wind as well uh, for the moment. And on top of that, we have the shortages on the gas and we have uh, a significant amount of nuclear power plants out for operation and maintenance. All this in combination means that uh, we're going to be short uh, like we haven't been for a long time. And it also means that uh, if supply is short, well, then prices go up. That is, the, uh, that is how things work with supply and demand. Okay. So the fundamental cause of the high prices at the most basic level is just there's a lack of energy in the system. Exactly. Okay. So... I don't want to go into regulation now, but a lot of discussions are kind of on market design. If we tweak this, then we solve the other problem. From the, what you're saying, it's no, we need to get more capacity rather to, to reduce prices rather than go after market design. I think we need to, to start uh, very fundamentally by fixing supply and demand. And since there is relatively little that we can do on supply for the moment, it's out of our hands, as, as we just uh, said. We need really to be looking at demand. We need to go into uh, energy savings like we have never done before. We need to be very, very serious about that, and we need to develop instruments that allow for a systematic effort to reduce demand. That's the only way we can get that equilibrium again. Uh, and once we get that, that will have some effect on prices, but we also need to remember that this is not a closed system. We are uh, part of a bigger world that is all screaming for energy and we are seeing very, very high commodity prices on the gas side, but also ripple effects, uh, knock-on effects into uh, biomass, mm -hmm. into coal, all of which are short for the moment and, and producing very high prices. Okay, okay, that's quite clear in the prices. You mentioned a bit about energy savings and I, I want to get your thoughts on that in a second, but before we go into that, Following the invasion, we had this repower EU strategy. I, came, I think it came in, in May this year. From your perspective, what do you think? Do you think we came with the right strategy to address the, the Russian invasion? And yeah, just your general thoughts on the, on the repower EU. I think the Commission did a decent job with Repower EU. They were acting um, under very significant time pressure and they came out with a comprehensive plan for how to uh, counter this situation. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in there when it comes to uh, build out of renewables and uh, essentially um, regulatory steps to ensure that we can accelerate. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there when it comes to electrification. Um, I do want to raise the flag on hydrogen, which is also a very significant part of this. Let's be clear, we need hydrogen for a number of different purposes, but we also have to be clear about the fact that hydrogen is not as energy effective, it's not as efficient uh, as uh, direct electrification. We're going to lose around 40% of the energy that we channel into hydrogen production just from the beginning. And what that means is that at a moment in time where we should be doing everything in our power to save energy, we're actually investing in a strategy that's going to cost us a, a lot of energy. And I'm worried about that. So if we break it down to different sectors, 
what sectors do you think have a huge potential to electrify more and what needs to be done to kind of uh, encourage this move? Well, let me say first off that we have seen some very good developments in the market over the last year um, on electrification. If we start out with um, with transport, which is is, is an obvious one, uh, the passenger car segment is one that is really, really fit for purpose when it comes to direct electrification. Um, the good thing is that the OEMs, uh, the car manufacturers, have seen that and have all engaged on very uh, bullish and ambitious strategies for electrification. That has basically um, had a direct effect and we now see 18% uh, of all new car sales being uh, electric, uh, something that uh, would have been very hard to believe a few years ago. If we move on to heat, um, we see that, uh, that up to uh, two-thirds of all energy in buildings could actually be electricity by mid-century. Uh, and also here we see a, a very positive development with, um, with heat pump sales really uh, taking a significant notch up. And um, a, I think we sold um, 2 million heat pumps uh, in Europe last year. Okay. okay. And because you discussed heat pumps, you discussed electric vehicles. What people often say is, you know, if these do take off the way the Repower EU strategy is saying and the way most analysts say they will, that we don't have the grid for it. Do we have the do we have the grid to cope with the changes which these will these will bring? We have a very a well functioning grid in Europe that is effectively connecting uh, customers with with power every day, uh, and that system works well. But it's also an aging system. We need to be clear about that. Uh, around a third of all the distribution grids in Europe are uh, more than forty years old, and if we do nothing. Uh, in the next 10 years, it's going to be more than half that reaches its its 40 years um, uh, birthday. So we need to modernize, we need to invest in grids. That is really a critical uh, uh, success parameter for the energy transition. Um, we need to invest to the tune of some uh, four to 500 billion in this decade to make sure that we are on track, to make sure that the grids uh, are resilient, to handle more extreme weather, that they're digitized to provide more granular services and, and handle more complex flows, and that they're modernized to basically um, be able to carry uh, increased volumes of renewables and serve more electric cars, more heat pumps, and so on and so forth. Okay, so what I take from that is yes, the grid can cope, but it's going to take a bit of money and we need to invest in grids. Is that a fair, that's, that's fair a, that's a fair summary. Okay. Thanks for that. Reading through the power barometer, when I look at the decarbonization of the sector, the trajectory seems to be pretty good. But reading through the slides, you all see coal has increased this, the, this past year. Is this something we should, should be very concerned about in the medium to long term? Or do you, do you see this as an anomaly given the excep exceptional circumstances? We need to make sure that uh, the way we deal with this unprecedented situation is one that is efficient and pragmatic here and now. Uh, on the other hand, uh, one that does not uh, uh, mean that we, we basically undermine our long-term goals. For me, uh, a temporal increase uh, in the use of coal is not the biggest of worries because Right now, we need to do our best to serve the energy needs while at the same time significantly reducing uh, energy. But we, we basically need to make sure that supply and demand meet. Um, at the same time, we need to make sure in the longer term that we're really staying on track, building out renewables, building out clean and, and renewable uh, power capacity, reinforcing grids uh, to pave the way for increased electrification of society. So you're presuming we're going to electrify, the electrification is the way to go. I imagine you're basing that presumption on the understanding that power will decarbonize. So can I ask from the power barometer, how is the sector doing in terms of decarbonization of power? The overall trend is that we are ahead of the curve. Uh, the power sector is decarbonizing faster than, than most other sectors, uh, and that has to do with the fact that we have a, a range of uh, carbon neutral technologies at our disposal. We have the nuclear plants, we have renewables, and, and those in combination really bring us to, to close to two thirds of, of carbon free energy uh, in the system today. 
looking towards 2030, um, we could uh, reach uh, almost a, an 80% decarbonization of the system, but it does require those investments in grids, mm -hmm. in the build out of the necessary uh, generation capacity, uh, and it is a bullish target. Okay, and when, I don't want to put you on the spot, but when can the power sector be fully decarbonized? What data are we looking at here? Uh, it, it really depends on the frameworks uh, that were given. What we said a few years ago is that we have the ambition to, uh, to uh, be fully decarbonized well before mid-century, and depending on the uh, frameworks that we're operating in, uh, what we're allowed to do in terms of the build-out by politicians and, and the broader society, that could be anywhere between 2035 and 2045, um, so it's really up to uh, the surrounding society to um, to determine that pace. Because what's holding us back right now is not some some grumbling CEOs. It is a, a lack of permitting to build what we want to build. It is um, a, a, an increasingly complex uh, regulatory environment. Those are the key barriers standing in the way of the full decarbonization. Interesting. So, because you discussed kind of renewables there, so when if I understand correctly what you're saying about renewables, it's no longer market-based issues. Renewables are competitive. If anything, they're probably the most competitive. But we face challenges in terms of permitting and maybe supply chains. Is that is that a fair understanding? That's absolutely correct. And what do we need to do? How can we solve that? Well, the first thing we need to do is to effectively deal with those permitting issues that are really uh, the key bottleneck for the moment. Projects are bogged down in uh, permitting delays of three to five years, typically. For bigger generation projects, hydro, or for grid projects, we're talking eight to ten years. Uh, and it just goes without saying that uh, we're not g going to be able to build stuff in eight years if we have to wait ten years for the permission. Um, so that urgently needs to be fixed and, and, and we need to do a whole range of things at the same time. We believe that the proposal of uh, these go-to areas is mm -hmm. a good one. Uh, we see a lot of uh, good uh, initiatives from the Commission to shorten lead times and, uh, and really to, uh, to digitize this, uh, allocate the right resources uh, as, as good steps along the way. Um, if we look at the other dimension, which is about raw materials, um, here we're looking at some, some, some really, really uh, complex new uh, territory in the sense that we are only really on the cusp of the transition from a fuel-intensive energy system mm -hmm. to a, a critical material-intensive uh, energy system. Um, up until now, in a world where people like to trade with each other, where everybody is more or less focused on, on, a, uh, on a pathway towards more democracy, more human rights, uh, and, and an effective uh, cooperation around global challenges, that was all good and fine uh, because we could source uh, solar panels from China, we could uh, get uh, other resources from other parts of the world. If we're now moving into a much more uh, complex world order with, uh, with regional power centers, with uh, geopolitics play playing a greater role, uh, our access to raw materials, our access to uh, manufacturing capacity will really be decisive also for the, for the ability of, of Europe to, to transition to a, a climate neutral economy. And, uh, and that raises new questions over supply chains, uh, manufacturing hubs, and, uh, and how we secure uh, that access. Interesting. So kind of a, an electro-intensive future is, to some extent, some of these raw materials become like new, the new oil, and the new Saudi Arabia, to some extent, will be the providers of lithium, cobalt, these, these, these kind of materials. It's, it's very interesting. If I go back, I'm from Ireland, and when we discuss kind of huge build-out of renewables, what lots of people say is that's going to pose huge challenges for, diver for biodiversity. Can we have this huge build out of renewables, which we're talking about, and also maintain biodiversity the way we would hope? Is that, is that feasible? Well, you know what? Uh, when it comes to maintaining biodiversity, I think we need to change our thinking uh, because what we've seen in the last few years is that actually 80% of all um, habitats in, uh, in Europe are in a poor state. So we need to 
develop our thinking from protecting nature to actually uh, going to a genuine regenerative effort for biodiversity. And this is one of the things that we've uh, taken up as a thought leader piece in, in your electric with, uh, with a project we called Power Plant, where we look at the electricity generation on the one hand and the surrounding nature on the other. And what we're finding there is that actually what's holding back uh, the deployment of renewables today is often other types of nature protection, which is giving these long lead times. Now, if we hold back our climate efforts uh, with referral to nature protection, we're going to land in the situation that climate change will neutralize all the other nature protection uh, efforts that we're doing. So the only way to do this is to uh, basically address this in an integrated way and see if we can go regenerative on biodiversity while deploying uh, renewable energy. And we find uh, in this project uh, a whole range of, of really good uh, examples of best practices that are already being deployed today showing that we can build out the power sectors needed while doing something good for biodiversity and even increasing biodiversity. Okay, that's, that's very interesting. And also you're saying climate change itself is a major challenge for biodiversity. Exactly. Not, okay, okay, that's interesting. I'm going to put you on the spot here a bit, but so it's been a crazy year. When we sit down together, if we sit down together in 12 months' time, what do you think we're going to be looking at? What sort of situation will we, will we be facing? We're going to be looking back on a historically difficult winter mm -hmm. where we've uh, made some learnings about how to go about uh, a much more uh, energy scarce uh, Europe and hopefully we've collected some some experience for how to deal with the next upcoming winter in 2023 which is also going to be difficult because um, we're already uh, challenging our energy storages our gas uh, stocks and um, and depending on how this winter goes uh, the next winter can be difficult or very difficult Hopefully, uh, we'll also be looking back at a year where uh, we've finally taken steps to, to decisively accelerate the deployment of renewables mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, to where we've also seen uh, progressive upgrades of uh, electrification in the end-use sectors. And then I think we will be well into the discussion at that time uh, on a new type of market design mm -hmm. that would, on the one hand, uh, serve European uh, citizens with fairly priced energy. On the other hand, provide a framework for uh, the transition to a green economy. If, uh, if we have a really sound proposal for that, I think that would be um, uh, a good uh, place to be. So Christian, thanks for, thanks for a fascinating discussion. I think it's fair to say we deviated quite a lot from the, the content of the power barometer and went more into kind of some industry trends, but I think it was, it was needed. So if people want to learn more about the power barometer, I would say please check it out on our website, Your Electric. And uh, thanks very much for your time, folks. Bye-bye.